I saw a baby who was at death's door. He had been the victim of abuse. I tried to help him as best I could. Um, I didn't do anything to hurt him or harm him anyway. The case against British au pair Louise Woodward captivated the nation. She was accused of being a baby killer, yet she seemingly fit none of the stereotypes. Her murder trial would provoke inflammatory debate about child care, working mothers, and the role of women in society. At the center of it was the tragic death of an eight-month-old boy. How he died and why is still being debated today. It was February 4th, 1997, in Newton, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. Around 3.45 p.m., the police received a frantic 911 call. The caller was a live-in British babysitter, 18-year-old Louise Woodward. My initial response was to call his parents. Um, I tried to page them, um, and I couldn't. I was in a panic because I just didn't know what was wrong with him. When paramedics arrived, Woodward led them to the dining room, where eight-month-old Matthew Epen was lying unconscious on the floor. The infant was gasping for breath and jerking uncontrollably. While the paramedics tried to stabilize Matthew, Woodward paged the baby's mother, Deborah, again. This time she made contact and told her what was happening. Matthew was rushed to Children's Hospital in Boston. The boy's parents were both doctors who worked nearby. They arrived at the emergency room within minutes. Matthew had slipped into a coma. Deborah Epen, an ophthalmologist, examined her son's eyes. She had seen the bleeding in his retina behind his eyes and was aware of what a, a bad connotation that had for his diagnosis. And, uh, and she asked me to pray for him. The infant was suffering a massive brain hemorrhage. Deborah Epen quickly concluded that Matthew's injuries were a textbook example of a type of child abuse called shaken impact or shaken baby syndrome. At about 5.30 p.m., doctors began operating to relieve pressure building inside the baby's skull. At the same time, the Newton Police Department began to investigate. Sergeant Bill Burns spoke with Matthew's doctors, who told him that the infant had most likely sustained his injuries just a few hours earlier. I asked him to elaborate on exactly what shaken baby means. He told me that usually there's a, a, a vigorous shaking of the young child, usually a, a children, you know, under the two years of age. At 7 p.m., Sergeant Byrne and three other policemen arrived at the Epen's house to interview the live-in babysitter. Byrne learned that Louise Woodward was working as an au pair, an untrained nanny from outside the U.S. who provides child care in exchange for room and board. Woodward had been living with the Epens for about three months and looking after their two sons, baby Matthew and two-year-old Brendan. The au pair told the detective she had been home alone with the boys all day. Matthew, she said, had been irritable since that morning. He was acting like he was tired, but of course it was only two hours since I got him up from his long nap. He started to get uh, cranky and upset. He said that she became frustrated as well and irritated that the child was crying and cranky and fussing. Detective Burns' report, which the teenager would later deny, had Woodward admitting that she had tossed Matthew onto the bed. 
The report also said the au pair admitted she had been a little rough with the infant when bathing him and might have dropped him on the bathroom floor. She told me that she dropped him on the floor. I said, why would you have done that? She told me that she was mad. Woodward claimed that at about 3.15, she had checked on Matthew in his crib and noticed that he was breathing in gasps and turning blue. She said she had placed the child on the floor and administered CPR, but he was still having trouble breathing. That was when she called 911. Detective Byrne excused himself and went into the kitchen to collect his thoughts. I'm sitting here with a young girl talking to her and wanting to believe more than anybody um, that she wasn't responsible. Feeling torn, the detective left the house, taking Woodward's passport, just to be safe. By this time, doctors had finished operating on Matthew. His injuries were so severe that abuse seemed the most likely explanation. Falls from a changing table, from a window, high-velocity motor vehicle collisions don't produce this kind of trauma. I saw a baby whose physical examination clearly showed that he had been the victim of abuse. Doctors discovered that the infant had suffered a two and a half inch fracture at the back of his skull. This suggested that he not only had been shaken, but slammed against a hard surface. This had caused a blood clot just under the surface of the brain. Doctors also noted that the baby had a wrist fracture that was at least four weeks old. The next day, Detective Byrne returned to the hospital to question doctors who had treated Matthew. One physician told him that the prognosis was grim. My heart kind of sunk when he told me that the child was on life support and there was a chance that the child may not live. Police officers have to build calluses on their emotions. But it can't happen. In a case like this, just tear away the callus. Byrne had no choice. The evidence and her police interview indicated that Louise Woodward was responsible for Matthew's condition. At 9 p.m. on February 5th, 1997, he arrested her for assault and battery. They arrested me on the basis of that 20-minute interview, which it then became my word against four policemen because they didn't tape the interview. They never asked me to go to the police station and make a statement. The next day, Woodward was arraigned in Newton District Court. She pleaded not guilty, insisting she had done nothing to harm Matthew. Her bail was set at $100,000. She was held at the women's prison in Framingham, just outside Boston. On February 9th, five days after Matthew had been admitted to the hospital, the Epens made the decision to remove his life support. The baby's relatives, including his grandmother, Wilma Spellman, gathered in his hospital room. We prayed and we read some scripture and Debbie played some music and... Uh... We all kind of said our goodbyes. The um, doctor disconnected the equipment. Sonny held the baby in his arms. And the rest of us left the room. Half an hour later, Matthew died in his father's arms. The next morning, the charge against Louise Woodward was upgraded to murder. Back in court on February 13th, Woodward once again pleaded not guilty. She was held without bail. Before long, she would become known simply as the nanny. The case touched a nerve, and parents everywhere began wondering how safe their children were. American justice will return in a moment. In February 1997, 18-year-old British au pair Louise Woodward was placed under arrest for murdering an infant in her care. She quickly became a lead story nationwide. 
It tapped into the ordinary anxieties of working parents. Could they really trust the person they hired to care for their children? In fairy tales, the, the witch has a, a wart on her nose and the dragon is breathing fire. And in a lot of crimes, you know, the bad guy looks like a bad guy. They don't in these kinds of cases, and particularly in this case. Here's a nanny who could have been anybody's daughter. Anybody might have hired her. The teenager's family and friends back in England were stunned by the accusations. They knew Louise as a level-headed girl, a trusted babysitter who often watched her neighbor's children. She wasn't sort of up and down in her emotions. Very, very calm, very calm young person. And it seemed inconceivable that um, she could um, react either in panic or under pressure. As investigators looked into Woodward's background, they discovered a young woman who came to America expecting an adventure and instead found a stressful job. Woodward grew up 150 miles northwest of London in the village of Elton. She lived here, in this house. Her father worked as a handyman, her mother as an administrator at a local college. After high school graduation in the spring of 1996, Woodward decided to spend a year in the U.S. before attending university. An agency in Cambridge, Massachusetts found a job for her, and off she went. At first, she was placed with a family in Manchester-by-the-Sea, a town 30 miles north of Boston. The teenager didn't like the remote location and objected to her 11 p.m. curfew. She decided to switch families. In November, she moved to Newton and began working for Sunil and Deborah Epen. Newton is just a short train ride from Boston, so Louise was able to take advantage of the nightlife. When Louise took the job, she was a little bit uh, defiant about not having a curfew, that she wouldn't need a curfew, but they said, okay, we'll try and work it out for a month and, and see how it goes. The relationship between Woodward and her new host family quickly soured as Louise developed an active social life in Boston. She often returned home late at night and had trouble getting up on time. This was a young woman who came here um, apparently interested in theater and children. Um, it appeared that her interest in theater and nightlife outweighed her interest in the Epen children. The Epens were a successful young couple struggling to balance their medical careers with their responsibilities as parents. Deborah Epen told her mother that the au pair had become more of a burden than a help. Things were not going well uh, with the relationship with Louise and she was having these problems of getting in late. Um, she said, now it's like I have to take care of a teenager too. The situation came to a head during the last week of January 1997. The Epens held a meeting with Louise. They warned her that she would have to start obeying a midnight curfew if she wanted to keep her job. Louise objected. I felt that I was over 18 and it really should be up to me to, to decide when I go to bed. It was just a few days after the confrontation on February 4th that Matthew Epen fell into a coma. Five days later, he was dead and Louise was in prison, charged with murder. The prosecution speculated that Woodward had shaken the infant in a moment of rage. When something got in her way, um, the family imposing a curfew, saying you've got to spend more time with the kids, um, I think it made her really irritated and angry. And, and Matthew was the immediate object of that irritation. Woodward's au pair agency agreed to foot the bill for her defense. It hired a team of lawyers, including Barry Sheck, a member of O.J. Simpson's so-called dream team. The attorneys built a defense based on the medical evidence. Among their expert witnesses was a neuropathologist named Dr. Jan Liestma. What he saw in Matthew Epen's CAT scans contradicted the prosecution's theory. According to Dr. Liestma, Matthew had not suffered a fatal injury on February 4th, 
He believed the injury had occurred at least three weeks earlier. Quite clearly, there was a skull fracture in the back of the head. In my view, it was a healing skull fracture. Dr. Leesma said Matthew had been living for weeks with a skull fracture and a blood clot called a subdural hematoma on his brain. He felt the boy's injuries were consistent with an accidental fall rather than an intentional blow. Eventually, the clot began to bleed again. That caused the pressure in Matthew's brain to rise, rupturing the blood vessels behind his eyes. A chronic subdural hematoma can be a silent bomb in a sense. Uh, ticking away and it may solve itself and go away and never come to anyone's attention. Uh, such things do happen and are well documented in the medical literature. If this were true, Woodward might not have been present when Matthew was hurt. This theory was supported by a puzzling piece of medical evidence. Matthew Epen's x-rays showed that in addition to his head injury, he had a wrist fracture that was four to six weeks old. Perhaps that fracture occurred in the same accident that cracked Matthew's skull. We have one camp saying shaken baby syndrome is a real phenomenon. We have another camp saying, no, it can't happen biomechanically. When you have a dispute in science, I say you don't have any proof beyond a reasonable doubt. As Woodward's attorneys prepared for a trial that was already making headlines, People from her hometown back in England were coming to her defense. Louise was plastered all over the papers as this nanny from hell, and, um, you know, this wasn't the young person we knew. Villagers gathered in homes and in a back room of the church. They raised money to fly Woodward's parents to Boston. Although it would not be admitted in court, Woodward's attorneys arranged for her to take a polygraph test. And the results were impressive. They strongly suggested she was telling the truth. I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. If anything, I tried to help him as best I could. And I didn't do anything to hurt him or harm him in any way. As the trial began on October 7th, 1997, reporters clogged the sidewalks in front of Middlesex Superior Courthouse in Cambridge, Massachusetts. By this time, it was clear that while Louise Woodward was the defendant, she was not the only one in the spotlight. Deborah and Sunil Epen were also the focus of intense public scrutiny. They lived in a well-to-do suburb of Boston and were typecast as yuppies, more interested in their careers than the welfare of their children. One caller to a Boston radio talk show said, quote, Apparently the parents didn't want a kid. Now they don't have a kid. Most of these insinuations focused on Deborah Epen. The working mother was criticized for leaving her children with an apparently irresponsible teenage au pair instead of staying at home and caring for them herself. To find that she was in fact demonized uh, for choices that every young mother faces and, and made reasonable choices about seemed to be very unfair for her and she took it very hard. It was becoming a public crucifixion. In its opening statement, the prosecution promised the medical evidence would show that Louise Woodward had killed Matthew Epen and that she had a motive. That baby's head went back and forth, back and forth, shearing the veins inside of his head, causing the retinal hemorrhaging. Prosecutor Jerry Leone asserted that Woodward had grown frustrated with her job and had taken it out on the infant. There was one person who had custody of Maddie during that time who could have inflicted the injuries, and that was Louise Woodward. There was also one person who had the state of mind at that time to have treated Maddie in that way, and that was Louise Woodward. Woodward's lawyers countered that scientific evidence would prove she had not shaken the child. Defense attorney Andy Good told the jury that the prosecution's scenario was impossible. They claim that Louise Woodward took Matthew Epen and shook him. <laughs> 
shook him, shook him for a full minute. Shook him. That, ladies and gentlemen, is less than 10 seconds. The defense said it would demonstrate that Matthew was in no way a victim of abuse. To the contrary, Louise Woodward was ready to take the stand and explain how she tried to save Matthew's life. But that didn't change the fact that the experts who examined Matthew Eppen at the hospital were convinced he was the victim of shaken impact syndrome. In an effort to win her freedom, Woodward's defense attorneys would have to take on the medical establishment. In October 1997, the state of Massachusetts began calling witnesses in the trial of British au pair Louise Woodward. First came the paramedics and police who responded to Woodward's 911 call. Detective Byrne recounted his conversation with the defendant, during which he said she admitted she dropped Matthew on the bathroom floor and was angry with the child. One of Matthew's physicians at Children's Hospital, Dr. Eli Newberger, testified that the shaking took place just a few hours before Matthew was hospitalized. In a dramatic demonstration, he showed the jury what he thought Woodward had done to the baby. An impact to be exerted in approximately the following fashion. The doctors that had treated Matthew Eaton were quite convincing in their analysis of what had happened or the timing of the injuries. After all their medical experts, the state called Matthew Eaton's parents. They recounted the agonizing hours leading up to their son's death. And, uh, then, you know, there was a flurry of activity. Everyone was working on him, trying to put in IVs, examine him, and uh, I was just sort of praying as hard as I could that everything would be okay. We were holding Matthew, and we prayed. And Maddie died. Deborah Eppen testified for two days. Unlike many witnesses in her position who lose control, she did her best to remain composed. Our family, we just don't let our emotions spill out. She was determined to be able to testify, and people thought that she should cry or something, and she said, well, if I'm crying, I can't talk, you know, I, I can't answer the questions, I can't think straight. What they didn't see was Debbie breaking down in the ante room every time we had a break. Um, that was how she held it together uh, on the stand. After the prosecution rested, the defense unleashed its own army of doctors to attack the state's version of events. Matthew Eppen did not suffer a violent impact to the head and certainly not on February 4th. The defense experts testified that Matthew's head injury was the result of an accidental fall about three weeks before he fell into a coma. They insisted the fracture showed signs of healing that would have taken weeks to develop. Woodward's attorneys raised two other issues. If Matthew's brain hemorrhages had come from being shaken, he would most likely have bruises where he had been held. But there were no such bruises on Matthew's body. No bruises on his shoulders. That is correct. In addition, doctors had found no evidence of swelling on the back of Matthew's head. The defense reasoned that if the infant had been injured right before being rushed to the emergency room, there would have been swelling. Woodward's attorneys believed that they were getting through to Judge Hillary Zobel. I was looking at Judge Zobel and he took off his glasses and just put them on the bench momentarily and just slightly shook his head. And I knew then that he understood that this was an older injury and Louise Woodward wasn't guilty. And at that moment, I knew that he was our judge. The defense team went on to attack the widely held assumption that shaken impact syndrome is both easy to diagnose and widespread. There are uh, a group of physicians 
who feel that uh, there is such a thing as a shaken baby syndrome. Frankly, the scientific basis for some of this, namely a commonly held belief is you see a baby with a retinal hemorrhage and that's a shaken baby. Uh, the, the literature and the data available doesn't support that. In her cross-examination, Assistant DA Martha Coakley attacked Dr. Jan Liestma. She presented a textbook the doctor had published several years earlier. In it, Dr. Liestma suggested that blood clots caused by child abuse have a tendency to look like older, accidental injuries. The doctor's book seemed to contradict his testimony. I could show to the jury that here's a man now telling them to believe something that years before he had said was incredible. Um, it kind of cut him short. It, I think it really cut the legs out of their testimony. In the child abuse arena, clearly new data has come in uh, to challenge widely held uh, outlooks and, and opinions. And I'm no exception. If one changes one's mind because of new data, <laughs> sorry, you got to live with that. Prosecutor Coakley scored one more victory in her cross-examination of Dr. Liestma. She got him to admit that Matthew could have been shaken. So you, you certainly can't rule out that the baby was shaken. And, and my question is, at this time, at some time, is that correct? At some time. There's no way I can tell. Near the end of the defense presentation, its most important witness took the stand, Louise Woodward. This was not a defendant who was going to admit she did it from the stand. You weren't going to get a Perry Mason moment in this case from the defendant. She was very well prepared. She was schooled. Woodward described in detail the events of February 4th, 1997. She told the jury she acted quickly when she realized Matthew had stopped breathing. I looked into the crib and um, he was unresponsive. He was... Um, he was lying there. Um, his eyes were half closed. He wasn't focusing. And, um, he was um, gasping for breath. He, he was kind of like, um, like this. She had panicked, she said, and had indeed shaken him, but gently, hoping to revive him. At the end of her testimony, defense attorney Andrew Good addressed the question on everyone's mind. Did you ever hit Matthew Ethan? No. Did you see Matthew Ethan's head become injured? No. And you just slam Matthew Ethan? No. Instead of crying in response to Good's litany of questions, as might have been expected, Woodward cracked a smile. I think Louise thought he was joking, and in fact he wasn't. Um, he was losing control because he was emotional about things. At that point, a little bit of me died because then I knew that uh, her head was probably on the chopping block and that was it. Throughout the trial, Woodward had occasionally smiled or laughed in response to questions. Was this the behavior of a malicious woman or an awkward young girl? Jurors would later say they weren't influenced by the teenager's courtroom demeanor, but they didn't think Woodward's story rang true. We didn't believe her testimony about what happened from 3 o'clock that afternoon until the time that Matthew was taken to the hospital. Prosecutor Jerry Leone cross-examined Woodward aggressively, hoping to expose her as callous. She held her ground, denying that she had ever told police that she had dropped Matthew Epen. No, I said I popped him on the bed. Popped him on the bed? That's just an English word. It means I popped him onto the bed. It wasn't until she took the stand at the end of her testimony that she uh, said that she told Sergeant Byrne that she popped the baby on the floor. That's absolutely untrue, absolutely unequivocally. She told me she dropped the child. Although Woodward performed well under cross-examination, her seemingly inappropriate reaction to the most important question in the trial weakened her case. Even so, the defense decided to take a major gamble. 
They proposed that the jury only be allowed to consider charges of first-degree and second-degree murder, not the lesser charge of manslaughter. What we wanted to do was to prevent the jury from compromising. We wanted either she's guilty of murder or she's not guilty of anything. Let her go. After warning Woodward about the risk she was taking, Judge Zobel agreed to exclude the manslaughter charge. The defense was criticized for allowing Louise to adopt this all-or-nothing strategy. Some call it the noose or loose defense. But it was clear that Barry Sheck and the other attorneys fiercely believed in their client and thought the jury would too. The verdict is next. On October 28, 1997, the fate of British au pair Louise Woodward was in the hands of the jury. They had to decide whether she had murdered eight-month-old Matthew Epen. In a tactical move, the defense had opted not to include a charge of manslaughter. The jurors had no middle ground. We have a young woman from another country who's come over here to work and experience life in Boston, and we have a dead baby and working parents, and there's nowhere to go with this. The jury deliberated for three days. At 9.30 p.m. on October 30th, they announced they had reached a verdict. Woodward's supporters back in her hometown of Elton, England, watched on TV in the local pub. This is the final guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Ah! Guilty of what? Guilty of murder in the second degree. Members of the jury, how could you have reported by the court? The jury. <laughs> Why did they do that to me? Why did they do that to me? When the jury came in, they didn't look at me. They were looking at the floor, and their faces were just uh, said everything, really. It was frightening. And then they read the verdict, and I just I couldn't believe it. Even Judge Zobel lost some of his judicial composure. Well, he looked pretty shocked. Um, you know, I mean, judges are taught to have a poker face. That's what they do. Here was uh, a judge who had allowed them to, to roll the dice this way. And, you know, unfortunately, here's a young woman who lost the roll of the dice. Outside the courtroom, attorney Barry Sheck expressed dismay over the jury's decision. We are stunned by this verdict mortified by this verdict to be frank we think it's against the weight of the evidence the jurors had a common sense explanation they gave more weight to the testimony of the doctors who had treated matthew Epen than to those who had not the defense doctors weren't there when these injuries had occurred and they were basing their testimony on their analysis after the fact. The jury simply did not believe the defense claim that Matthew's injury could have been sustained weeks before he was admitted to the hospital. It was unreasonable to think that these injuries had mysteriously occurred in the past somehow and gone unnoticed for days or weeks. The morning after the verdict was announced, Judge Zobel gave Woodward the mandatory sentence of life in prison with a chance for parole after 15 years. Crowds had been gathering outside the courtroom throughout the trial. After the sentence was announced, tempers flared. Louise's supporters lashed out at those who felt that the Epens had been vindicated. If there had been irrefutable proof of her guilt, okay, fine. But since there wasn't, she should have been let free. I just felt really physically ill to imagine that this young girl, just one year older than my own teenage daughter, would be going to prison for the rest of her life. As Woodward was taken into custody, her attorneys did damage control. In a hearing four days after the sentencing, the defense requested that Judge Zobel throw out the jury's decision and rule on the case himself.
the judge agreed to consider overturning the verdict. Judges in every state have the authority to reduce a murder verdict to manslaughter, although it's a power they rarely use. On November 10th, Judge Zobel announced his decision. He reduced Woodward's verdict from second-degree murder to involuntary manslaughter. He released his judgment to newspapers and several websites. It was the first legal decision ever released over the Internet. Zobel wrote that although he was convinced Woodward was responsible for Matthew Epen's death, her actions, he wrote, were characterized by confusion, inexperience, frustration, immaturity, and some anger, but not malice in the legal sense. In a hearing held later that day, Zobel reduced Woodward's sentence to time served. I remember him rendering his decision and speaking in somewhat legalistic terms and Louise not really understanding what was going on. Um, and I wrote her a note saying, you're free. He's letting you go. We were incredulous. Uh, we, we just thought that the bottom had fallen out from under us. That just seemed like it tipped the scales of justice upside down. Woodward had served just over nine months in jail. Judge Zobel reduced the, the verdict to, I believe, the lowest he possibly could. I'm actually convicted now of involuntary manslaughter. I believe that he believed my medical evidence. There are a whole lot of people doing a whole lot more committed time in jail for doing far less serious crimes than Louise Woodward did. And I think that throws the system out of whack, off balance. And from that perspective, I think it was unfair and unreasonable. Judge Zobel's decision was not unprecedented. He was known in the Boston legal community as something of a maverick and had overruled jury verdicts in the past. That did not make his decision any less controversial, as prosecutors warned that his ruling may have a chilling effect on juries in the future. Back in a moment. In November 1997, 11 days after a jury in Cambridge, Massachusetts found Louise Woodward guilty of second-degree murder, the presiding judge announced his decision to reduce the verdict to manslaughter. The ruling intensified an already raging debate. It was frustrating to have a 13th fact finder, if you will, decide that his view of the evidence was the right one and to reduce the verdict. But it was the decision to reduce Woodward's prison time that especially rankled prosecutors. Rather than a life term, Judge Zobel sentenced Woodward to time served. That meant she served nine months behind bars. Certainly the way in which he sentenced her indicated to us that he believed she should have been acquitted. There's no other explanation for that. The defense countered that Louise never should have been charged with first and second degree murder. This prosecutor didn't do justice from day one. Judge Zobel took care of that. And in that respect, that's the beauty of our legal system. Defense attorneys still maintain that Louise was wronged by a guilty verdict of any kind, even for manslaughter. They suggested that the jury was not qualified to evaluate the scientific evidence. Prosecutor Martha Coakley, however, insists the jury made the right decision. These were 12 people uh, who thought about this case for a long time. You had the best defense in the world. You had the best experts in the world in some respects. If they could not create a reasonable doubt, I think the evidence was pretty clear. In Boston, the airwaves were flooded with armchair jurists who had their own opinions about the fate of Louise Woodward. Most people do time for this, Bill. I agree, but I think the, the other thing in his judge's decision was um, he didn't think there was malice involved. It was, they still had to blame somebody, and it was, as it came about, it was easier to blame her than blame the parents. Long after the trial, arguments raged over who was responsible for Matthew Epen's death. His mother remained a convenient target. 
The couple received piles of hate mail from people who blamed Deborah Epen for her son's death. As we fight, as, we, as women fight with child care and professional questions, uh, we always want to, you know, make sure we've done the right thing. And I think we hold ourselves to a high standard, we hold other women to a high standard. And it did seem to be totally unfair. And yet it also, I think, showed the extent to which this case just pushed a lot of buttons for people on daycare and on dual career families and how we take care of our kids and how we provide for them safely. In response to the Woodward case, Families across the country bought so-called nanny cams, surveillance devices that secretly recorded a babysitter to see if children were being abused or neglected. In June 1998, Louise Woodward left the U.S. and returned to her hometown in England. What do we want? The people who worked so hard to support her hope that her name will one day be completely cleared. It was always felt that, well, it'll be the medical evidence in the end that will prove Louise's innocence. Um, and it may be years before that happens. Woodward has tried to get on with her life. In the fall of 1998, she enrolled in law school in London. She said her career choice was motivated by her experience with the American justice system. Just when it seemed the excitement had died down, the CBS News program, 60 Minutes, broadcast a controversial report in March 1999. The program featured two doctors who theorized that Matthew Epen had never been shaken. Instead, they said the injuries on his neck indicated he might have been strangled. They also suggested the baby had been abused over a long period of time. It was an outrageous and irresponsible uh, production by 60 Minutes based upon two doctors on the West Coast who came up with uh, a crazy, crazy theory. While the program never directly accused the Epens of abuse, the implication was clear. In response, more than 70 pediatricians signed a public letter denouncing the program's findings and demanding that CBS News apologize to Sunil and Deborah Epen. CBS News stood by the report. Through it all, Louise Woodward has firmly maintained her innocence. I know in my heart that I did nothing wrong. And the people I love and the people I, who know me know that I, I'm not capable of that. The only thing that was on my conscience was that I may not have done enough. I like to think that if Louise Woodward has a conscience after the dust settles that she'll come out and, and say, I was only 18 years old and I made a horrible mistake and I want other people to learn from me. We just can't let Maddie's memory dissolve. He was here for a purpose and I think we need to let him make the best of his little life. The week after Louise Woodward was convicted, the Massachusetts legislature voted on whether to reinstate the death penalty. At the last minute, Representative John Slattery, who had been a supporter of capital punishment, switched his vote, saying the Woodward case had convinced him that, quote, we can't always... It was February 4th, 1997, in Newton, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. Around 3.45 p.m., the police received a frantic 911 call. The caller was a live-in British babysitter, 18-year-old Louise Woodward. My initial response was to call his parents. Um, I tried to page them, um, and I couldn't. I was in a panic because I just didn't know what was wrong with him. When paramedics arrived, at 7 p.m., Sergeant Byrne and three other policemen arrived at the Epens' house to interview the live-in babysitter. Byrne learned that Louise Woodward was working as an au pair, an untrained nanny from outside the U.S. who provides childcare in exchange for room and board. 
Woodward had been living with the Epens for about three months and looking after their two sons, baby Matthew and two-year-old Brendan. The au pair told the detective she had been home alone with the boys all day. Matthew, she said, had been irritable since that morning. He was acting like he was tired, but of course it was only two hours since I got him up from his long nap. He started to get uh, cranky and upset. He said that she became frustrated as well and irritated that the child was crying and cranky and fussing. I saw a baby who was at death's door. He had been the victim of abuse. I tried to help him as best I could. And I didn't do anything to hurt him or harm him anyway. The case against British au pair Louise Woodward captivated the nation. She was accused of being a baby killer, yet she seemingly fit none of the stereotypes. Her murder trial would provoke inflammatory debate about child care, working mothers, and the role of women in society. At the center of it was the tragic death of an eight-month-old boy. How he died and why is still being debated today. Woodward led them to the dining room, where eight-month-old Matthew Epen was lying unconscious on the floor. The infant was gasping for breath and jerking uncontrollably. While the paramedics tried to stabilize Matthew, Woodward paged the baby's mother, Deborah, again. This time she made contact and told her what was happening. Matthew was rushed to Children's Hospital in Boston. The boy's parents were both doctors who worked nearby. They arrived at the emergency room within minutes. Matthew had slipped into a coma. Deborah Epen, an ophthalmologist, examined her son's eyes. She had seen the bleeding in his retina behind his eyes and was aware of what a, a bad connotation that had for his diagnosis. And, uh, and she asked me to pray for him. The infant was suffering a massive brain hemorrhage. Deborah Epen quickly concluded that Matthew's injuries were a textbook example of a type of child abuse called shaken impact or shaken baby syndrome. At about 5.30 p.m., doctors began operating to relieve pressure building inside the baby's skull. At the same time, the Newton Police Department began to investigate. Sergeant Bill Burns spoke with Matthew's doctors, who told him that the infant had most likely sustained his injuries just a few hours earlier. I asked him to elaborate on exactly what shaken baby means. He told me that usually there's a, a, a vigorous shaking of the young child, usually a, a children, you know, under the, two years of age. 